if you don't have any strong opinions, well, how do you feel? I'm curious, Noah. How do you feel uh, for the upcoming election season? Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm not incredibly happy about it because uh, I'm not a big Trump fan. Do you and, think Trump, uh, you think he's looking good right now? I mean, you know, he's, he's in, in the last week, Biden has started to look stronger in the polls, but then large numbers of people, you know, are going to vote for Trump. And he's been looking strong in the polls. And um, you know, he's not he's not a popular figure. I think people just have this, you know, undefined floating dissatisfaction that a lot of them are taking out by saying, oh, I'm going to vote for Trump. I think that's, you know, the, the electorate is in a bad mood. America is in a bad mood. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that you know that makes me sad. I don't want to see American in a bad mood. Sure, I feel like a lot of that tracks with the uh, like the consumer sentiment and the feelings about the economy and how people's personal finances, everything are doing. Do you think as that turns around, or do you think it's going to continue to turn around? Do you think that's going to have a significant impact on the upcoming election, or is there still like? I think it absolutely will. I mean, this yeah. is this is the best economy we've had since the 1990s, which mm -hmm. is older than you know most people can now remember, and. Mm -hmm. Like that, you know, I, I can vaguely remember it. I was a kid. Uh, you know, it was a it was a very good time. But this is this is as good as the economy gets. You mm -hmm. know, like inflation is low. Uh, people still remember what something used to cost in 2019. And they're mad because, you know, when you go see, uh, you know, um, a, uh, a piece of fruit cost more than it cost in 2019 you're like wow inflation but then eventually that fades from people's minds after like a year people see that that fruit price is no longer changing you know it's no longer going up yeah. they're like okay you know inflation sort of fades from their mind we have actually have evidence uh, that that it takes about two years total for this to you know really fade from people's mind and and you know it'll be like two years this summer since inflation really started to fall mm -hmm. and uh yeah so so i think um a lot of people, it'll it'll be farther from people's mind, and the fact that you know everybody who wants a job has a job, basically at this point. Yeah, and um, and jobs are better than they've been. Wages keep, you know, wages are are going up. You know, they took a hit. Wages took a hit in twenty twenty two, but now they're going up, and um, you know, incomes going up, wealth going up, stocks going up. You know, for for those of you who own stocks, like for those of you who observe Stock Day, it's uh. That's going up. And so, like, I think, yeah, it's going to filter through. It's going to eventually make its way into people's minds that these are really good times. And I think that will do something. I don't think that's going to sweep Biden to, like, victory on a, on a tidal wave of economic optimism, but I think it's going to have an effect on the margin. Okay. Do you, uh, just a quick, uh, I guess, a quick thing on econ, because that's something I'm not as informed in, but I'm very interested in. Uh, I'm sure you've watched over the past two years as there's been the constant prediction every single day for the recession that we're always headed for. Uh, then there's been this obsession of economists who are like pouring through data, trying to figure out like where is all the economic anxiety coming from because the Twitter sentiment seems to be so horrible and the social media sentiment seems to be so horrible. And now all of it is like kind of flipping around and people are like, maybe it was, I know the vibe session was really popular on X for a long time. Uh, a theory that I read the other day, I think this was also on Twitter, it might have been on a subreddit, that was floated, was that maybe one thing that we're seeing is a, an emergence of like a homeowner versus like renter economy to where these are two disparate groups of people that are going to be treated like very differently. Do you think there's any truth to that? Like low interest rates and asset appreciation are helping homeowners, but if you're a renter, you're kind of like in a weird, screwed place right now? Uh, well, so, you know, rent is, um, has been going down. Mm-hmm. And so, um, is that true? Wait, really? Well, yeah, actually, I just said yes. Yeah, rent's been rent's been going down for about a year. Oh, not, I don't okay. mean I don't mean the pace of increase has been going down. I mean rent the actual the actual, the, rent the actual number has been going down for about a year in America. So when you say that the uh, rent is going down, like just as a lower number, uh, compared to what? Like, is it at the level that it was say in 2020? Is it lower, higher? What are we talking here? Well, it's, um, it's back to, like, I think the level was in 2021 um, in terms of, of where it is. The, the thing is that there's several different rent uh, indices. There's, like, new rent, like, if, you, uh, if you're just signing a lease now. There's rent, uh, you know, considering all the people who are still on lease. Um, 
and stuff like that. And so I, I think that the new rent, you know, rent, if you're just now starting to sign a lease is, is pretty back down, you know, um, might be back. So 2020 is a, is a weird year to compare to because rent really crashed during COVID. Sure. And so that's, a, that's a weird year. Um, but I think that, so, so, you know, comparing to 2021 is probably a better comparison, maybe 2019. Well, uh, um, I wanted to do it during Trump's tenure, just uh, again, since we're talking about the economy and we're talking about the election, like Biden's chances, Trump's chances. I'm just trying to get because a lot of the things I hear from people are this idea that the economy is doing better isn't being felt right. It's not being felt by right. the public. Um, and I, I'm not sure how true that is, but it is something that I consistently hear. I just think people don't feel it overnight. You know what I mean? I think people, you know. Rent goes down across the country. That's an average. Some people's rent drops. Some people's rent goes up. Some people's rent stays the same. Um, and I think that, you know, if, if if more people's rent goes down than goes up, we economists aggregate those statistics and say, oh, rent went down, right? Median rent went down. Average rent went down, whatever you want to say. But most people don't necessarily experience those declines. Those declines only happen for some people. So you've got to um, you know, either here, if you're not one of the people for whom that decline happens, I mean, first of all, two thirds of households are homeowners in this country, right? So those people that, you know, they don't care about mm -hmm. the rent going down. So, so you're talking about one third of people who might even care about this to begin with. Yeah. Right. And then if like, if like one out of five of those gets a rent decrease and one out of seven gets a rent increase, that means total rents go down, but it still means that, you know, the one out of seven are like, my rent went up. And then the one out of five people get a rent cut. And, um, but you know, it's, that's one out of five of, of one out of three is one out of 15 people in the country gets their rent cut. And then, you know, so, so it, it's, I think it, I also it's a real thing. It'll filter through, but it not won't <laughs> be this like tidal wave of, of happiness that just crashes over the country immediately. Here's a question as well. I, and I'm, I'm going, I'm running on intuition and I could be wrong. My guess is going to be that if you have a unit and the market value rent for that unit increases, you're probably going to increase the rent burden on your uh, renter. My guess is going to be that if the uh, if there's a decrease, I don't know if you would actually cut their rent or if they move out, you would just list it for the lower rent instead. Like I feel like there's probably a higher chance that you would charge the higher price. I don't know how often landlords cut rent. So that could be the case too, that if you are increasingly, uh, if your rent is increasing, you see it go up. But if you're moving into a unit whose rent is decreased, you have no idea what it costs before you just see like a listed unit for whatever price. That'd be my guess. I could be wrong on that. That but, is smart. That's right. Um, you know, you're absolutely right. So one also, you, you, know, you, have to, you have to look at the people who like moved to a new place and they're like, wow, my new place is cheaper, but it's actually kind of nice. You know, like, wow, mm -hmm. I got a good, I got a good place for cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, which is my situation. I, I recently moved into a good place for, for cheap. Yeah. Um, and One then thing I, I noticed, you know, um, I noticed this in general politics when it comes to polling on certain issues, and now I'm applying it more to economic, and really probably everything, is granularity is really important when you're doing metrics. Like when, when you have like a, a statement like, oh, what does wage growth look like for the entirety of the United States? Or what does like rent look like for the entirety of the United States? That oftentimes these numbers are entirely meaningless. Uh, at best, sometimes incredibly misleading at worst, or, or downright lies, depending on how you aggregate or disaggregate data too. So that's also another thing that I've been keeping a closer eye on. That sometimes the broad aggregates miss a lot of the stories that would be seen if you were more granular with your, uh, I guess, charts or data collect. Yeah, no, no. I agree. Yeah, that's right. So I think uh, that, you know, but but I think we start, we're starting to see it make its way into the economic statistics. You know, we're starting to see consumer confidence go up last, um, Last month was like the biggest jump, biggest single month jump that we've seen in a really long time. I think the biggest, the, the best comparison is to look at the, the data from the 80s. Now, to go see what it was actually like in the 80s, we'd have to go ask some old people, right? Mm -hmm. Because no one remembers, no one, you know, none of us are old enough to remember, uh, you know, what it was like to, you know, work and, and buy a house or whatever in 1983. <laughs> like I'm, I'm yeah. old, but I'm not that old. Um, so like, you know, uh, but but when you look at the consumer confidence, you see that it was really in the dumps. You know, they had inflation, this massive inflation of the 70s that lasted for a long time. Then you had uh, raising interest rates a, a ton. And so, like, it was very hard to buy a house for a few years there. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, massive unemployment from that. You saw yeah. just a big, big recession from that. And then so, of course, economic you know, consumer confidence was way in the dumps. And then it started to rise. 
uh, you know, 1983, uh, you just see it start to like go up. And then in, um, and then like over 1983, it just over that year, it just absolutely soars. It flips from completely negative to completely positive as inflation goes down and as interest rates get cut as a result. Mm -hmm. I think what will have to happen is we'll have to start to see to, to really get the same surge here. We'll have to start to see the cutting of interest rates. So I think a lot depends on the Fed. Um, you know, whether or not the Fed decides that inflation is enough in the rear view mirror where we can afford to cut now, or whether or not we need to keep rates high for a while just to make people absolutely sure that inflation is not coming back, you know, like double tap the inflation. Well, I think um, it's also important when we think about inflation, um, we're really thinking about like a rate of change. And we need to remember that there is an underlying function that has to be taken into account because the cumulative effects on inflation are felt. Right. So like if inflation is 10 percent year over year over year over year for like a whole year. Right. If you get if you get 10 percent inflation and then the next year it comes down to one percent, it's like, oh, look, inflation is below our target. That's good. Well, the cumulative effects of that inflation are still going to be felt. The lingering effects are going to be onwards until wage growth outpaces it eventually. So I think it's probably OK, considering how much inflation we've had. I think the cumulative is still pretty high, although certain sectors of wage growth, I think, have, have started to outpace uh, cumulatively where it was. But probably yeah. good as long as we're not seeing big unemployment i don't know why we would like rush to cut rates now you know well i mean it could be that so so the reason they might cut rates is that the longer you keep rates high the more stress it puts on certain economic sectors and you risk so the economy is doing great and inflation's come down mm -hmm. but if we keep rates high for a long time we might kill the commercial property sector because commercial property sector is already hurting you know if you if you're like a developer you own like office buildings right or, mm -hmm. or a developer just an owner of office buildings that's what you you do uh you're hurting because your entire business relies on being able to borrow to uh you know to buy buildings to renovate buildings and then in those borrowing rates are high at the same time the demand has gone down because um uh, uh you know remote work work right? from home yeah. people aren't going to the office as much anymore you know they're they're they've returned to the office somewhat but not you know uh, a ton and um and so that is sort of a structural thing that's hurting the commercial property sector. And so if you if you pile on the commercial property sector with interest rates, you could have a lot of those those property developers go bust. At that point, banks, you know, the United States banking sector has shifted away from lending to like, you know, industrial companies, software companies, whatever. Those people all go to the bond markets to borrow, right? They borrow, they get money by issuing bonds. And so if you go to, uh, if you're a bank, who, who who's borrowing money from banks? Well, real estate. That's who borrows money from banks. It's a developer. And so banks, you know, our big banks have a ton of these commercial property loans on their books. They always did. They always have. This isn't a situation like 2007 where they had all these subprime loans on their books, right? It's, uh -huh. it's they, they loaned to reputable commercial property developers with very, very good financials. But what was a very, very good financial in 2019 is no longer a very good financial right now because, um, you know, rates are just a lot higher than anyone realized they were going to go. Um and uh, and also the remote work thing. Those are two things that in 2019, no one could have predicted. No one was predicting either of those things. Yeah. And so, because um, COVID just came out of nowhere. And so the thing is, if you leave interest rates high for one year, that's one thing. If you leave interest rates high for five years or three years, maybe, you might just crack the commercial property sector. You get bad loans. Banks stop, you know, lending. The real estate sector sort of goes in the toilet because banks stop lending. And then that filters through to the rest of the economy and we get a recession, right? We get Well, would banks stop lending completely even for like residential loans and stuff, or would they just like cut back on the commercial lending? Well, that's a great that's a great question. So the answer is that if it's only a bit, if the commercial property sector only suffers a bit, then they'll just mm -hmm. cut down on that sector. Yeah. But if the commercial property sector suffers a lot, they'll cut back on everything because of capital adequacy. So Oh, uh, because you have to have it, you have to maintain a certain reserve in order to guarantee your whatever. Yeah. Right. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I would be, I would say, obviously, I'm just circle jerking. I, I'm pretty sure we both agree, but like, obviously, they should be careful that we don't want to cut rates to influence the entire economy just to stave off what could be an inevitable collapse of commercial real estate anyway, too, right? I don't know how big the work from home threat is to commercial real estate. Um, I just see, I just read headlines and articles where people say that like the restructuring of work has dramatically and forever altered the office workspace. And if that's true, then I mean like that sector is probably going to fundamentally change regardless. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. We want to, we would like to let it down gently instead sure. of letting, you know, like you don't want to take a sector that's, that's structurally shrinking and hit it over the head with a sledgehammer to the point where people are, are waiting for unemployment lines in the sure. cities of America. Yeah. Like there's no need for that.